in today's topic, I want us to look into why a lot of traditional African homes had a dome shape either on the roof or the entirety of this of the structure and why many of them especially the ones that had an entire structure in a dome shape did not have windows so i know some of you might be very curious as to why this was the case so if you're interested to learn more please stick around here are a few images that i kind of put together to paint a picture of what i'm talking about this is a building, as you can see, buildings from the Mascam community. They all come in a dome shape. I love the exterior of it and how it has all these nice ridges. And as you can see here, we do not have windows, but we do have that opening at the very top. You see that cylindrical part at the very top here? It does have an opening. This is another style of that dome shape building that, that I was talking about. This is a Dingurai Mosque in Guinea, and you can see uh, the structure itself is massive, but you don't necessarily see any windows anywhere here as well. And then this is another one, a little bit different. So it seems like the roof itself is the one that has that dome shape, and it's a little bit big. And then, oh my God. I love the Bamikele architectural design. This is one of them. You can see this is just, you know, a normal rectangular shape. But the very top of it, it does have that huge roof, which is also in a dome shape. Now, I know some of you, when you're looking at these images, a few things might be coming or popping in your head. And you might also have a few concerns. For instance, uh, the very obvious one is the ventilation portion. Uh, some of you might be curious how in the cold or hot weather these buildings might um, do and how they regulate heat. And then obviously there's that big part about lighting because we, we don't have visible windows. So what happens? Let's take a step back and start to address some of these concerns that some of you might have. Let's start with the ventilation portion. Now, the reason why a lot of these buildings were built either in a dome or pyramid looking like shape, it's because when there is a dome, air conditioning is operated by the dome itself because the dome makes the house warm when it's cold and cool when it's hot. In fact, you can test this theory by making a pepper pyramid or dome shape um, and cut a piece of apple and then put it beneath that dome or pyramid shape that you just created and cover it and then get a different piece of paper. Make sure that it's not a dome or pyramid shape this time. Pick any other type of shape that you want. Cut an apple as well and put it underneath. Leave both of these uh, pieces of apples for three to seven days and then come back and see which one um, is going through that rotting process faster. Now, if you do this experiment correctly, I assure you, you'll start to notice that the apple piece that was underneath the dome or the pyramid shape will, be, will look much more fresher compared to the one that you put in this other type of structure. And it's simply because of that process of, you know, for some reason, the dome and the, um, and the pyramid shape, you know, it allows, you know, air to be, uh, well circulated within uh, um, that space. Uh, and so it provides a natural way of air conditioning. To answer the second question about heat and cold, I came across uh, this really beautiful article done by the National Geographic. Uh, the title is The Extraordinary Benefits of a House Made of Mud. And I'll just link it on the description below if any of you are interested to learn more then please, I would encourage you to go ahead and read it. He was talking about how, you know, especially mad houses, they are naturally known to keep the house cool, especially dur during extreme temperatures. Um, and that mixed with the natural ventilation that is achieved by the dome shape or let's say the pyramid uh, shape of the overall structure of the house, it contributes significantly to an incredible architectural designs that ensures the home is just well ventilated um, during very hot or cold seasons uh, in a very natural way. And in fact, this is the reason why uh, many of the um, African traditional architectural designs 
are said to be environmentally sustainable. It's not just the building materials, but the design of it and the structure of it and how um, our forefathers were able to harness natural ways of either cooling the home uh, or heating the home naturally um, during cold or hot weathers. It's incredible. It's almost genius because think about it. This was done way, way back even before we had computers and all this fancy technology that we have now. And so people now use air conditioning machines and think about the amount of waste. Think about the amount um, of energy consumption that we are using. You know, some of these uh, machines have what we call uh, HFCs, uh, which uh, emit potent greenhouse gases which technically contributes to the degradation of the ozone layer. And so there's a lot for us to unpack there. At the end of the day, yes, we are cooling our homes today. We are heating our homes. But at what expense? At what expense? This is not sustainable, you know, for the environments that we are living in. And so we have to get to that place where we we come to, up to with a, with a nice compromise where we start to understand how are we able to now start to utilize some of these natural ways to be able to achieve sustainability within our environments? And I think that is an important point to consider. Let me talk a little bit about lighting. Lighting was not great. I don't know whether our forefathers were prioritizing security and the natural ventilation, but it was not as bad as people think it was because as you can see this is a mass gum community home and i was saying that it has that uh, opening at the very top and this is how it looks from the inside so from the outside you might think oh my god this is this house is in complete total darkness but it's not true uh they did have some degree of lighting obviously if you compare this to what we have now there's room for us to improve here and this is what i've been talking about the if we had a real opportunity to go and utilize the indigenous knowledge that our forefathers uh, have built, this is a good foundation for us to continue to expound and do research and see how we can continue to, um, to add to this technology in a sustainable way and in a natural way so that we can continue to have more beautiful homes. But it seems like we've put all that aside and we've gone to the extreme side, which is quote unquote, what we call now the modern day of living. And we are pu putting all these concrete blocks everywhere. We're utilizing huge amounts of energy at the expense of the environment. And I think this is where there is room for us to go back tap into the indigenous knowledge and evolve that knowledge to suit our environment and our type of live, our ways of living right now. So a few things that I, I, I just want to call out, you know, um, uh, that you guys can try is number one, you can try the experiment of the dome shape and the apple um, and taking that piece of paper and putting the apple underneath because the more you learn and the more you teach others then this knowledge you know can sort of can be expounded right the other thing that i would encourage you to do is let's try and be conscious consumers and i know many of us at the point where we are trying to build a home and when you're in the process of building a home i want to challenge you to first consult with village elders, uh, consult with ec community experts who are uh, experts in building traditional homes so that you can start to get some new creative ideas that maybe you are not able to get these ideas in your um, local education system uh, because there is some restriction there for good reason and we can talk about this in another video. But I want to challenge you to start engaging the local communities because once you start to do that, you learn something new, you know? And it's it's a way for us to be able to bring back honor, to pr bring back the, pr the pride, the prestige that we've lost over time, and even possibly create new opportunities for these local experts, if, especially if you decide that you're going to, uh, to work with them. I know for a fact, 
a lot of multinational hotels, they go to the villages, they seek out this knowledge, and then they build all these beautiful resorts in Africa that are not even owned by us as Africans. And they're built with indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge. And I can show you in real time. In fact, a good example is if you go to South Africa, you see a lot of um, some of the resorts really resemble the Zulu homes, you know? And so think about it. If these big business people are already doing this, you know, what about you, the person who is already living there in the motherland? What if you start to take the advantage of this indigenous knowledge and you start to enrich yourself and your community and others? Now, that could be a game changer. So that is all about being conscious consumers. The second way in which we can be conscious consumers is... Um, to challenge the architects that we choose to work with to start to incorporate African traditional um, uh, architectural designs in the, in the homes that we're building. There is no problem with us uh, uh, working with hybrids because the more of us do start to demand or ask for African architectural design, then the way it works is that we, the consumers, have the power to push the supply and the demand. The other thing is that when you decide that you're going to take that step and you're going to build you, your home, um, I know this can be a daunting task, but pick up a camera, pick up your phone, you know, uh, record that process, share it publicly, you know, so that we can start educating each other. I tell you for free, doing research on African architecture is one of the hardest jobs because the information is very scattered. It's very limited, and some of it is, frankly, um, there's a lot of misinformation as well, and for good reason, I think it's created that way so that we can have a gap, because when you have a gap, you tend to look at other options other than your own, and so let's, 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 let's encourage each other to document our stories and share them publicly. I mean, that's why I do this channel anyway. Um, and then... Lastly, we do import a lot of products, building products from, uh, for building from other countries, especially China in Africa. And right now there is a big uh, movement where uh, a lot of like Chinese architectures are spread across Africa doing all these multi-story uh, buildings. And <sighs> I, I don't even know what to say about that because I feel like that's a missed there's a huge missed opportunity there to design these buildings to fit the aesthetic of where we are living. And I know that is part of urban planning uh, and governance, and that is something we can talk about in another video. But I want to encourage us to use local materials when we're building as much as we can. There is, there is, there is an opportunity for us to start creating a market for ourselves. Because think about it, when you're constantly importing things, who is benefiting more? Yes, you might have what you call a beautiful home, but who benefited more in that whole process? Think about it. So these are just some of the few things where I feel like we can start to utilize the old indigenous knowledge uh, that has been hidden from us and we can start to incorporate that in our modern day world and we can start to change the way we are living today as Africans and we can start to challenge each other. You guys let me know what you think, especially about this topic. Um, uh, did you find it useful? Did you find it informative? Let's discuss on the comment section and until next time, cheers.